Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our program at Mechanics Institute Online for Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and the History of Erasure and Exclusion with author Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, who's joined by our San Francisco Poet Laureate, Tongo Eisen Martin. I'm Laura Shepherd, Director of Events at the Mechanics Institute. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Institute, we were founded in 1854 and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. Uh, we feature our general interest library, an international chess club, and ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. So please visit our website at milibrary.org. And also we're open, our doors are open and come down to the library uh, five days a week. You can see all the listings of our programs and also the hours of operation, et cetera, on our website. So please come and visit us. I also wanna mention that um, copies of books by our authors tonight, um, Not a Nation of Immigrants is available at alexanderbook.com or at any of your independent bookstores. And um, copies of Blood on the Fog by uh, Tongo is available at City Lights Books. So you can get that online or visit the bookstores in person. So what, what a powerful and potent topic for tonight. It seems like we as Americans have many conflicting ideas and values uh, about what constitutes our country's identity and citizenship. You know, most of us have grandparents or parents that, that immigrated to this country uh, as immigrants or refugees. And waves of immigration due to industrialization, poverty, genocide, famine, political disruption, corruption, and now climate change have been catalysts that have influenced the flow of people to the US over several centuries. So we're gonna be talking about the various attitudes and stigmas uh, about immigrants and our attitudes that prevail tonight with two experts. And I'd like to in introduce our guests. Uh, Rox Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz grew up in rural Oklahoma in a tenement family, farming family. And she has been active in the international indigenous movement for more than four dec decades and is known for her lifelong commitment to national and international social justice issues. Dunbar Ortiz is the winner of the 2017 Lannan Cultural Freedom Prize and is the author or editor of many books, including An Indigenous People's History of the United States, a recipient of the 2015 American Book Award. She lives in San Francisco and you can connect with her uh, on her website. And Tago, Tongo Eisen Martin is a poet, movement worker, and educator. His latest curriculum on extrajudicial killing of Black people called We Charge Genocide Again has been used as an educational and organizing tool throughout the country. His book titled Someone's Dead Already was nominated for a California Book Award and his other book, Heaven is All Goodbyes, was just published by City Lights Pocket Poets Series and shortlisted for the Griffin's Poetry Prize and also won a California Book Award and an American Book Award. And his latest book, Fog, A Blood on the Fog, also published by City Lights uh, Pocket Poets, just came out. And he is also co-founder of Black Freighter Press, but most important, he has just been nominated as San Francisco's eighth Poet Laureate. So please welcome our two guests, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz and Tongo Eisen Martin. Welcome. Hey, hello everyone. <laughs> much, 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 much appreciation and, and, and uh, thank you, especially uh, Roxanne for the, for the honor of this conversation. Um, to 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 almost to 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 not necessarily go straight in into a deep end, but to ask you to 
play predictor um where how you know given you know we we had we had this heightening of of contradiction um you know it's it, it with, with the uh, you know with uprisings with uh you know kind of the the uh the 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 uh it, the excitement or, or the 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 um, self confidence of this neo Confederate tendency when you you look at the performance art they pulled off in, in the Capitol um, now seems to slid to a, a, a kind of a lower altitude. Uh, when do you think or how much time do you think we have before contradictions heighten again, and what do you think that might look like. Well, we got a glimpse. Oh, thank you, Tongo, and thanks, uh, Mechanics. It's wonderful, and everyone who's with us. Yeah, we got a glimpse uh, with the Trump uh, four years and kind of continuing what is um, possible, um, you know, an armed insurrection <laughs> in the Capitol. That was, that was something unusual. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, I think there's a lot of fear, uh, and, uh, dread, uh, we have many, um, crises ahead of us, the climate change, um, that's looming, uh, that we're living with already. I mean, it's here mm. and it's going to get worse and, um, if we don't have some competency in governments, uh, it's um, going to be difficult. And in the subject of immigrants and refugees, uh, they're going to be, there already are, but they're going to be huge numbers of climate refugees. Mm -hmm. And rich countries have an obligation. They're ones in the United States uh, has created one third is what they've calculated. One third of the carbon that uh, you know that that exists in the atmosphere from industrialization, but Western Europe created the rest, hmm. and yet most of the people who will be affected are in areas of the world um, in the south mostly that uh, are gonna be devastated, especially island people, and people on shorelines. So we have a duty, I think, uh, here to find a way, you know, to change people's minds about, um, I mean, it's one of the reasons I wrote the book is to raise consciousness about how badly um, immigrants have been treated in the United States, especially on the border, but also in general, you know, it's a, it's a real grind, or it's a real meat grinder they have to go through. Mm -hmm. And um, we accept very, very few refugees. I think Afghan, Afghanistan, there are 2 million uh, refugees in uh, Iran, more than that in Pakistan and 150,000 in Germany, mm. only 5,000 in the United States. Mm. And we created them, we created those refugees. So uh, this is, um, it's a very serious time. And uh, I think uh, those of us who write and speak uh, and especially poets, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a great believer in the power of, um, of, of poetry to get to people at, at a, a level that's not just in the brain, but in the heart. Mm. In, uh, in, in, the, in all of your research for this book, what, what did you, did you come across anything that really surprised you? Where there was, you know, moves that so, uh, these people made or or this or or uh, you know a government uh you know a, a move that that the state apparatus made 
Well, it's much worse than I thought. You know, it's a settler colonial country, the United States. It's a settler colonial state. That is, um, there are not that many of them. Um, mm. uh, the, that, you know, wiped out the majority of the indigenous inhabitants. There's the United States, New Zealand, Canada, Australia, and Argentina and Uruguay on uh, South Africa, they only got to 30% or so um, in um, colonization of Ireland, only, you know, in, only in the North, uh, the Scots-Irish who were set as settlers uh, who are only half, the Irish Catholics are still half. So the United States, it's also the most powerful country in the world based upon its uh, real estate and enslaved labor that built capitalism. And so we as people in the United States have a kind of individuality that comes with, I mean, a state being formed as a capitalist state is the first one, the first republic that was formed as a capitalist state. So we, we have those values of property, of competition, of individualism, that mm. doesn't lead to community. Mm. And we see people trying to make community through religion or organizations and all of us, um, uh, and and it's very difficult to sustain, and it and on a large scale. Um, so, the thing that surprised me most was how the United States needed settlers to replace the indigenous people when they took the land, they needed people to buy that land to build. So they really had to recruit, you know, they had to take flyers to Scandinavia. People were very poor in the early 19th century in Scandinavia, even hunger, famine. Uh, so you, you get some Scandinavian refugees, um, uh, German, you know, the, these countries were poor poor at that time, Eastern Europe. So then they, they are very badly treated once they, they come. They have to go through this process mm. of fitting into a settler state. So it's um, historian, the late historian Noel Ignatiev wrote a wonderful book called How the Irish Became White, you know, blue-eyed blonde English-speaking people as refugees. Um, and Republicans, they're colonized people, colonized by Britain. And yet within 20 years of their arrival as starving refugees, they had become the police. They had joined slave patrols. They were anti-Black racism is sort of the, as James Baldwin says, it's the requirement <laughs> for an immigrant mm -hmm. to be accepted as an American. So it's a, um, one, another reason I, I wrote the book is hopefully, you know, uh, people who are immigrants or children of immigrants, the title alone will, you know, bring that readership. That was who I was really speaking most to is try not to become a settler, <laughs> you know, to understand, try not to become Americanized because we need to change mm. this country. And immigrants can help do that. You know, they come with different views, especially third world immigrants. Now. Could could you talk uh, uh, more about this? Uh, you know, these kind of processes of turning immigrants into shock troops for the, is that these colonial masters. You want me to read a little bit about that? Right on about the Italians. This is uh, chapter six of the book uh, that's titled Americanizing Columbus. 
During the 1880s, a million or more Italian immigrants arrived in the United States, mostly from Southern Italy. Suffering the stigma of being Catholic, in a Protestant country, and also dark complected, they were subject to extreme discrimination. Italians and other Catholic immigrants became Americanized and accepted as white through the Roman Catholic Church and a process rooted in the myth of Columbus, especially with the 1882 founding of the Knights of Columbus by the Irish Americans and the subsequent 400 year anniversary of Columbus first landing in the Caribbean. This was a, a self indigenizing process with the Catholic Columbus being positioned as the original founding father of the United States. So in this chapter, the important role of ideology and identity politics in building the capitalist militarist United States is reflected. Like the mass of Irish famine refugees preceded them four decades earlier, the majority of the 4 million Italian immigrants to the United States were fleeing grinding rural poverty in Southern Italy and Sicily. They were peasants stuck in medieval socioeconomic relations while others were proletarian, sharecroppers and migrant farm workers, all without skills beyond agriculture. Most were motivated by jobs in the booming US industrial revolution with plans to earn money to return to Italy and buy land or start a business. In the United States, Italian migrants were met with endless insults in newspapers and magazines, which described them as swarthy, kinky haired, and criminally inclined, and regarded as racially impure in an era of pseudo race theory of eugenics. Their children were often refused access to schools and adults were turned away from public places and labor unions and even in church forced to sit in segregated church pews set aside for black people. They were catcalled on the streets with epitaphs like Dago and Guinea, the latter a term of derision applied to enslaved Africans and their descendants and more racist insults like white inward and inward WAP. In 1912, the US House Committee on Immigration debated whether Italians could be considered quote, full-blooded Caucasians and immigrants coming from Southern and Eastern Europe were considered biologic, quote, biologically and culturally less intelligent. Employers often preferred light-skinned Slovaks and Poles to Italians, even though they were also Catholic. Mm. Railroad bosses wouldn't hire them because of their small stature. In the mining industry, English-speaking workers held the skilled and supervisory positions, while Italians were hired as laborers. Even those who were educated and skilled were unable to secure any jobs besides manual labor. Only in the 1920s did Italians become more integrated into the workforce. More Italian immigrants were employed in semi-skilled jobs in factories as well as skilled positions, but a third remained in unskilled positions. Even Italian American union members faced prejudice with meetings held only in English and Italians were not elected to official positions. In 1885, a group of Italians in New York formed the Sons of Columbus Legion to celebrate future Columbus anniversaries, mingling with the Irish and the Irish American founded Knights of Columbus who had succeeded in getting the 76 foot Columbus monument installed at the center of Columbus Circle in New York in 1892, the 400 year anniversary of Columbus. By then the Irish had spread throughout the country. And as uh, Michelle Rolf Truyo notes, with the full benefit of white status, Columbus himself became more Irish than ever. 
until Italian Americans made new gains in the continuing contest for racial and historical legitimacy. The Knights of Columbus lobbied state legislatures to establish October 12th as a legal holiday. And by 1912, they had succeeded in 14 states and two decades later convinced the Franklin Roosevelt administration to make it a federal holiday. The oppressed masses of Italian immigrants would find the attachment to Columbus an avenue to acceptance. They realized that the accepted representation of Columbus as first founder of the United States served to connect being Catholic and being Italian with the very birth of the United States. Therefore, Italian immigrants could present themselves as Italian descendants of the original Italian Catholic founder, not so much as immigrants, but returnees as part of a revised origin story of the United States. Historian Daniel Battisti shows how casting Columbus as the first immigrant rewrote history, even though he never set foot on the continental landmass that became the United States and was never an immigrant himself. And even though the English colonies that became the United States didn't even exist in 1492. Later in 1965, when Italian Americans campaigned to overturn immigration exclusion restrictions, they employed the origin story based on Columbus to great effect. In 1971, James Baldwin wrote, I've had my fill of seeing people come down the game point on Wednesday, let us say, speaking not a word of English, and by Friday discovering that I was working for them, and they called me the N-word like everybody else. Malden critiqued the tragedy of how the immigrants pursuing the lie of white supremacy quote, helped to steal the vitality from immigrant communities and in the debasement and defamation of Black people, they debased and defamed themselves. He wrote, white people are not white. Part of the price of the ticket is to delude themselves into believing that they are. Baldwin characterized the United States as a destination where Europeans of all sorts could be melded in contrast to Negroes and Indians. He wrote, no one was white before he or she came to America. Rather, they were Irish, German, Italian, Jewish, English, French, Swiss, Norwegian. But in the white republic, one is either white or not. Italian-American journalist Christine Grimaldi laments what she calls the paisanos of shame Italian ancestors and contemporary Italian Americans such as Rudy Giuliani and Mike Pompeo who celebrate Columbus as an ancestor and embrace right-wing ideology of white supremacy. She writes, those of us who challenge whiteness through activism and essays still benefit from it too. We will never experience the racist COVID-19 backlash against Asian American people and their businesses though the virus overtook Italy and traveled from Europe to New York. So that gives you an idea of the processing mm -hmm. of immigrants and turning them into settlers and racists. Mm. In, in, your, in your research, did, did you um, kind of, uh, uncover who who were who were like the managers of that re uh, of that rebirth or or was it or, or did it really stand um or or how how strongly did it stand on already cultural uh precedents you know like like Gerald Horn kind of asserts that nobody turns that psychotic even in a generation, <laughs> let alone in a month, you know. Right. Um, so, so getting into the 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 architecture of that uh, grooming, uh, yeah. what 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 did you who what protagonist did you find? 
Well, you know, settler colonialism in the United States is such a um, a really, really distorted, dehumanizing process. It's linked with genocide. Um, in every case, ever colonialism has the aspect of genocide. It's the attempt, uh, like the Boers in South Africa, to kill and replace the people who are already there. So this was from day one, you know, in the British founding of the colonies, um, a settler colonial, it was the first settler colonial experiment. If you don't count Iberia, you know, where they ethnically cleansed the Moors and Jews uh, to settle uh, in 1493, deported them all to North Africa. Um, that was a kind of model. That was the, the model of what then Columbus was the connective tissue uh, to the Americas. So it's such a, um, a rotten, a rotten kind of platform mm -hmm. on which the United States was founded. 150 years of of uh, chattel slavery and um, you know forced importation of um, Africans um, and genocide, uh, pushing out um, the indigenous farmers and villages out of the what, what became the 13 colonies. So this was the fundamental basis. And then the primary document before the constitution, the Northwest Land Ordinance, Northwest referred to what was called the Ohio country, um, the reason for the independence uh, to uh, because the British wouldn't allow the settlers to expand, especially expand slavery over the Appalachians. So they kicked the British out, you know, and um, uh, headed for the Pacific and China. That was their stated goals at the founding. And so this Northwest Ordinance laid out the maps to the Pacific and the it, it was very, very um, thought out. The process of taking the continent was actually planned. They even had in the Northwest Ordinance the once an area was taken, it would be under military control until they had eliminated or outnumbered the indigenous residents, whether they were Native Americans or in the case of Mexico, taking half of Mexico, uh, Mexico. And only then could it apply, you know, it could be handed over to um, a non-military but still federal control until it was even more settled, uh, settlers coming in, buying the land and then eventually statehood. And that often took three or four decades mm. of genocide, of um, violence. And this was step by step. That was just the North, the, you know, the Ohio, which was turned out to be eight states, you know, from Michigan, Illinois, Ohio, Ohio. Not, not, just, not just Ohio, but it's called the Ohio country and pushing those native people out who formed confederations and tried to fight them off then in the South, you know, so constant war every day. Mm. The United States existence has been war. There's never been a day without US making war somewhere. Mm. And once they reach the Pacific, they jump over, you know, to colonize the Philippines and uh, Guam and all the islands of the Pacific. And the goal was always to control China. Mm. Still is, isn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we see how um, kind of 
strong um, corporate media as well as really almost, you know, with media, entertainment, um, Texas education, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, really uh, gives, you know, gives the, 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 the consciousness um, of, of, of most people uh, that this kind of just full immersion in a conformity to, to an, an imperialism uh, did, did you find the same uh, uh, that same um, broadcast or did, uh, the broadcast being that just as effective um, back then or was this hyper militarization just so ingrained in the you know the the day in day out culture that it wasn't as necessary yeah militarism was so ingrained in you know in the conquest of the colonies, which took 150 years, you know, to um, ethnically cleanse those 13 colonies that became the first state. So it was a bloody, um, you know, genocidal project. And I wonder, I know you've uh, written poetry about genocide. Could you read some of your <laughs> poems? Yeah. No problem. <laughs> um, uh, societies uh, wander together like hopeful drops of a virus. Citizen testaments bent on offering me a nation of breadwinners to hold me back. Like it's a Brinks, I wrinkle the concrete sometimes like flesh. My Martin Luther King permanence turned away from a podium into the reeds like God is the dangerous twin. Black August to the mountaintop balcony on my bedroom floor, you know, they steal you from the earth itself and suspend you and your broken neck from their foolish euphoria, from the loyalty oath of their gray superstitions, loyalty oath of their agrarian reform, I return to my mother completely disrespected. For peeling the heat off of purgatory, they kill poets like me. Walk me away from my poems never to be heard from again. In this final industrial complex of bloodlines picked over, picked through a sport and spiritual death of your devil, at least half made police become a pretty word. I'm reading a lynch mob shoestrings like they were tea leaves, teaching you how to write about cities. It's the 25th century in the mirror, people. Tyranny against your chump change, your chump to be mocked even with a gun in your car. A cubit of needlework spelled tomb for the proletariat, the relapse ministry. Talented people curled up in a fetal position next to a diamond dying just another service day in the theatrics of tea house fascism and a bouquet of surveillance cameras in the poverty of God. New blue eyes, corpses of water, newly potted presidency of one big shiny coin if you ask animated capitalism and other non-literal voids. Killing is white freedom. The deification of hyphens. Medicine bread and picture shows, great protesters in LA, guests of our ink, drop kicking roses in the graveyard. DC mink like a stone torn in half, the pen advances despite CIA guideposts, despite non African past and futures, a metaphorical but not surreal day in a horn ridden life, horn player improvising king. Like a radio prize fight featuring Shango himself, a real hand sweeps the land of racism. May I return to the ground? May I make progress with the gun? Our mother Emmanuel, they put on music that evening, a swinging type body language for you to drink with fermented $5 bills for your body language, some applause, my past stomach lining, neither a good thing nor a bad thing like being psychic on the way to a lethal injection. It'll sit you down with Lady Day. Lady Day leading youth who surrendered their souls to Africa too soon. Polity thought floating in a cup of water, she saved me, accessing my stomach, accessing the love of the American lynched. Coat sleeves wooden and avalanche into the wrist. Our mother Emmanuel avalanche into the sharp keys. Pain, the deal you make with pain. A piano makes sense for them. Laying hands on the world gradually, addressing the bend and necks on the streets to the north. Travelers sailing in pain, repeating pain in the north. Ten trigger fingers on that piano of harmony would have me. Putting a hundred fights on every direction offered her. Lady Day leaning on trees again, recruiting the countryside itself, saying, lay your plan out on this lightning, make your poems the corner pocket of men. I've greeted the blues itself. America may clean my dead body, but will never include me. There goes the poet, killing without killing. Never mind this painting of your language. May I be a meaningful lynching, a crow's passing. Good and dead by the afternoon. I'm off to make a church bell out of a bank window. The kitchens meant more to the masses back in the day and before that we had no enemy. Somewhere in America, the prison bus is running on time. You're gonna lose your job before a revolution hits. 
somewhere I won't be home for breakfast. Everyone out here now knows my name and I won't be turned against for at least four months. The cop in the picket line is a hardworking rookie. The sign in my hands getting more and more laughs. It says the picket line got cops in it. I can take care of those windows for if you want, but someone else got to go inside your gas tank. It was clear to me that rich people had talked too much this year. Hey, why don't you go ahead and throw down that marble park bench everyone's looking up at? You know, get the Romans out of your mind. Maybe a good night's sleep would have changed the last 20 years of my life playing the instruments like punching the wall. What, what, what would you have me do? Replace the population, get brotherhood back to the winter, stop smoking cigarettes with the barely dead. You know, they listen in on the Sabbath. Police called the police on me. There was a white candlestick beneath my detention. I ruined the soup again, thought the judge as he took off his pilgrim robe behind the white people's door and more. I didn't get lucky. I got what was coming to me, toast. Hey, find me back, the man said, of course, to himself, washing windows with a will to live, tin can on his left shoulder, enjoying the bright brand new blight with all party goers, both supernatural and supernaturally down earth. And what is this elevator traveling side to side? Like 1,000 bitter Polaroid pictures that you actually try to eat all the furniture on this street, nailed to the cement cheap furniture, but we have commitment. This morning, an essay opens the conversation between enemies, why? because you control every grain of processed sugar between here and a poor person's border. Because in a tin can on my left shoulder, I can hear the engines of deindustrialization. You should get into painting, you know, tell lies more deeply. This month I'm rooting for the trader, carting cement to my pillow here. We will build them high again, not talking much. And once you climb up the organ pipe to our apartment floor, I'm high again, calling everything church, singing along to a courtyard, thanks to a horn player's holy pastime. I'm just putting a real jacket on it. Talk about a real five years. Keep memories like these in the pocket next to the tall receipt. That man, Lost a wager with the God of good causes. I mean, stood up for himself a little too late, maybe too early. I could still see 20 angles of his jaw zigzagging through the cold world of deindustrialization. There's an art to it. I will tell my closest friends one day. Thank you. Right on. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Much appreciation. Um, uh, 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 back back to the 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 president, um, or back to your uh, prophesying. <laughs> um, uh, um, as 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 uh, this late stage imperialism grows later and later, and it seems that these shock troops are more and more being left behind. What is the modern incentive for 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 them to participate in this uh, settler colonial project yeah you know we've seen um really started in the 70s as the backlash as i see it to uh the civil rights movement mm. uh this fear of the, it started very quickly. The John Birch Society was formed in uh, 1956, uh, three years after the Brown versus Board of Education desegregation decision that they realized these were very wealthy people. Uh, Fred Koch, uh, father of the Koch brothers who funds many right-wing things now. Um, and of course, Robert Welch, the candy man, <laughs> the candy fortune man, mm. um, formed the John Birch Society and um, named communism as the, the, the United States was going communist, uh, as the same as, um, as the attack on white um, supremacy. So they somehow combine the two. Uh, I remember as a very young person um, that I wrote a letter to the editor. Uh, there had been the, the, in the civil rights movement burning of black churches. And someone had written a letter to the paper. This is in Oklahoma where I grew up uh, that um, it was really communists who were doing that, burning the churches, that um, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the Ku Klux Klan, it wasn't white people, um, because the black people were communists and, and um, they wanted people to feel sorry for them. So um, I thought that was outrageous. It was ridiculous because, you know, I've been raised a Southern Baptist and I was pulling away from it and, um, I, 
I felt like the you know white Southern Baptists around me, you know, the perfectly capable of turning mm -hmm. black churches. And um, mm -hmm. so I wrote that. So I got all this mail from um, about communism and I couldn't figure it out. They had pictures of the Metropolitan Opera showing communism. And it finally dawned on me, it's because it was black and white people together, you know, black, the Metropolitan Opera had integrated. And so anyway, this, this kind of conspiratorial thing was there, but then our, you know, the, our youth movement of the civil rights movement set off the youth movement, red power and brown power and black power and um, then anti-Vietnam War, massive demonstration. So we, and I was part of that, um, we, and the women's movement, uh, we thought we were winning. <laughs> but um, there was there was a counter revolution that came, mm. and um, the Second Amendment, uh, the NRA, got taken over by the Second Amendment Foundation, founded by a former border guard, white supremacist, formed this white supremacist group called the Second Amendment Foundation. So that was one thing. The NRA got taken over in 1975 by, it had been kind of a, you know, just a hunting and fishing uh, you know, kind of thing, coupons and stuff, but it became a really a white, it's a white nationalist outfit now. Mm -hmm. But that's when it became um, white Vietnam vets coming back, uh, the Rambo stuff, you know, mm -hmm. POW stuff. And then Reagan getting elected definitely a, a fascist. We had already had him for eight years in California as governor and he tore apart the un university system and um, wrecked everything and then became president and wrecked more. Mm -hmm. So this was, uh, and then these uh, uh, white farmers started, you know, the uh, malicious, began malicious. And then it accelerated in the 1990s and blew up with, of course, the Oklahoma City bombing, white nationals did that. And um, so now this has been a long process and it, I kept telling people, I could say, you know, growing up in rural Oklahoma, I, I was noticing these things because some of them, you know, I, I knew, I, I knew some of these people. I mean, I, I knew who they were. And people on the left were kind of blase about it. Oh, they're, you know, they're nothing We're still, but we saw our movements uh, disappear, you know, and you know, of course the whole Central America interventions um, that overthrowing, you know, trying to overthrow the Sandinistas uh, succeeding you know, in the late eighties and stopping the revolution in, in El Salvador and Guatemala. So um, it's, it's been, you know, it's been a process that's taking place that now we have, um, uh, you know, they elected a president. And mm. in 2016, um, and we could see that there's actually a very large number of people. This isn't a small group. This is at least, you know, 30 million people. Um, so it's, uh, you know, our future is not, um, not very bright uh, in terms of what, what we need to be thinking about. And as far as, you know, Immigrants and especially the border goes, this is, there's such an anti-immigrant sentiment in the United States that Trump only put it into words, you know, vulgar as he was, they're rapists, they're crooks, you know, they're gangs, they're 
um, which simply wasn't true. Mm-hmm. And um, but every, immigration policy has always been based on exclusion, deportation. This poor Cambodian guy who, who was a prison firefighter when he was young, he was involved in a robbing, killing, and spent 10 years, and then he got parole for good behavior. And he still, he, he was put in, they picked, ICE picked him up to deport him, even though he'd never been to Cambodia. His family left as boat people, went to the Philippines. He was born in the Philippines. So if they deport him, he'll go back to a country he's never been to, does not speak the language. Um, But this is heart, you know, just heartless. And and of course the border is just uh, the Haitians recently, Mm. We saw this treatment, uh, horrible mistreatment of, of people. So, like I said, um, we have we have to find some way to um, make this wealthiest country in the world um, turn around and 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 take responsibility. You know, for damage done, but also just you know just that wealth that that is needed. Um, the ships, why don't the the whole U.S. military become a refugee um, rescue mm. uh, operation? You know, rather than um, you saw that for a split second um, with the Indonesian. Uh, earthquake and then tsunami back in the uh, early part of the century. Um, U.S. warships were, you know, were acting as medical ships, uh, were rescuing people. Mm. And it was so nice to see. And I think the military people, people in the military really loved doing that as they did when um, uh, in the, um, you know, with the uh, um, voting and you know the pandemic and all uh, of the National Guard being able to serve in a non non war capacity. So I think people in the United States, the majority of us, you know, want to do um, what is positive, but we're not very organized. Hmm. Um, we we want to uh, give uh, uh, our audience now the, uh, the 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 uh, the the opportunity to round out the rest of the conversation uh, uh, with uh, uh, with questions. I, I see a, a a couple in the the chat. Um, one 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 question you 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 covered uh, I think a couple times as as far as uh, what do you see happening in our Future, but if I may make that question actually a little more specific, um, what are prospects of you know unity, uh, especially between um, black and indigenous, um, you know, po- political efforts or revolutionary efforts, as well as well as um, as well as uh, brown people too, who who have uh, who definitely found themselves. Uh, in the you know in the, on the wrong end of the uh, of, of the spear yeah well hopefully we can revive something like um uh existed in um chicago back in the 80s of um the uh black panthers and the american indian movement um Puerto Rican Socialist Party in this rainbow coalition. This was not the, you know, Jesse Jackson took that for his campaign later, 20 years later, but it was uh, it was an amazing thing and it, it spread, you know, into different places, but it, it, um, it had its uh, birth in, in Chicago. And uh, it also included 
these uh, poor white Appalachian, uh, you could almost call them refugees, you know, from the closing of the coal mines and all, very, very poor white people um, were in that rainbow coalition. So I think uh, uh, it, was, it was not only ethnically, uh, you know, a um, coalition, it was class-based, you know, in working class. People were all working class. And so I think we don't pay enough attention, you know, to the working class. It's a very diverse working class now. Mm -hmm. And um, I was so excited as many other people were with the Alabama Amazon attempt, you know, at unionization. Um, but, but getting, I, th I think that would be a good basis for our developing unity is uh, to think about, you know, reintroducing or, or looking at, look at James Tracy and Amy Sony's wonderful book on the Rainbow Coalition, you know, and, um, and how it functioned, you know, in depth. And uh, I think they, they wrote that book with that in mind you know, to, for us to think about that this, this is still possible, you know, it's possible to, and more needed than ever now. Uh, this, this, this next question, I think represents two of the, the, the questions. Well, um, for those of us working in teaching capacity, what are some ways we teach youth of color who may have PTSD to respect themselves in this colonial settler state? There was another question too about, um, you know, uh, healing, um, healing what, what what might be interpreted as a, a kind of a low cultural esteem, self esteem. Now, say the first part again. Well, I'll give, I'll give you line for line. <laughs> uh, for, for those of us working in teaching, uh, what are some ways we teach youth of color who may have PTSD to respect themselves in this colonial settler state? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there is so much trauma in this society, um, especially for people of color and especially youth. Um, it's so hard uh, to be young in this country and uh, um, imagine a future that, um, uh, that is not very likely um, to come to pass, uh, you know, in a, in a good way. So I think, Education is, is the, the sites of education, formal and in, informal, um, community groups that are also involved in education, bringing speakers and all. These are vital, you know, vital teachers are, are really, really important people. Um, uh, it, there, no one would go into teaching to become rich. Uh, to be famous <laughs> or uh, for any other, uh, I mean, it's, a, it, it's something I decided to do very young and uh, I've never regretted um, a, uh, you know, a, a life of, of teaching. Um, and it can, because it, my own experiences with education, I feel like saved my life that it's sometimes the only anchor, that uh, sometimes it's the only meal mm. that a young person has, uh, you know, the only sustenance, the only love and care. There's um, a lot of dysfunction uh, that's associated with poverty and drug and alcohol use. Um, uh, the injustice system that you know juveniles uh, get caught up in um, that mark their whole lives, you know, forever, end up in prison. 
So we have to form community to deal with this and um, really, really support our teachers, you know, insist on uh, reasonable priced housing for teachers. They can't even live in the Bay Area. They have to commute from the Valley and even there it's getting expensive. Um, so this, we, we have a very, um, uh, even here in, you know, in probably the richest state of, of the country, we have so much poverty and uh, uh, dysfunction. And so I think, uh, I think we have to, uh, Well, you know, I keep saying community, but it's been so hard in the past two years, of course, with the pandemic to, mm -hmm. um, to sustain community. Hopefully we can get back to it. Um, we all hate Zoom, but at the same time, it's, <laughs> it's been a lifeline. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the last question, I, I know we, we, we're we almost out, out of time, but uh, the, the Nobel Prize in Economics was, was given to David Card and other researchers who proved that immigrants do not take jobs from others. How can we move the attitudes from a grassroots level to policy level? Yeah, this is the, you know, the mythology of um, Immigrants taking jobs uh, is is um, perpetrated, I think, from above, uh, it, it, because it, in order to cheapen labor, you know, uh, capitalism is is so corruptive that um, the more contingent that workers can be, like the Bracero system, uh, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, and then the deportations, the Operation Wetback, uh, that was its official title in the 1950s, that, you know, the, the Mexico has been a, um, a pool of cheap labor for the United States since, um, since half of it was uh, taken um, by war by the United States. And we live in former Mexican territory uh, and indigenous territory. So we have to, um, we have to honor immigrants, but like in my book, it's not it's not a nation of immigrants. It's an, a nation of settler colonialism, a state of settler colonialism in which immigrants are expected to become settlers. And if they are people of color, especially poor people of color, you know, the United States has very tough quotas. They require, mainly they allow people who, that, well, mainly they do brain drain of third world countries, you know, the India and Africa, they educate their people and then they lose them to the United States. Uh, doctors, um, uh, a medical education in, in uh, Mexico is free all the way up to, you know, a licensed doctor and about one third end up going to Canada, getting recruited by US or Canada and rarely get their doctor's license. They, they do x-ray or lab, but they get paid 10 times as much as they would in Mexico. So this brain drain is not the same thing as fair immigration, you know? And so when there are poor people at the border, Central Americans, um, climate refugees, but also refugees from US wars in the 1980s that ruined their countries, smashed them and then didn't rebuild them. And um, Haitians, uh, US occupied Asia uh, for 35 years, the Marine occupation, 
and then kept dictators in power. And so these refugees that we, we create, then we call them unwanted immigrants um, because they're poor. So I think we have to become aware of the unfairness of US immigration policies um, and refugee policies. It's just unacceptable that um, United States refugee 56,000 people a year are allowed to have refugee status in the United States, a country of 350 million people, the richest country in the world. There's no other place has such a restrictive uh, a restrictive uh, refugee policy. So, yeah, I think we need uh, we need to, uh, you know, I, it's kind of a trick title, not 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 a nation of immigrants, of um, of hopefully people who are against immigration will read it and change their minds. <laughs> not is a is a you know, they might be attracted to it. Yes, let's get rid of those immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I, put, I, I greatly appreciate you. I, I, if, if we could all give a, a kind of a silent round of applause for Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And um, thank you to the Mechanics Institute for, for hosting us. Thank you. And thank you, Tom. Uh, also I also want to thank uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz for her compelling and powerful book, and also to our San Francisco Poet Laureate, Tongo Eisen Martin, for your incredibly ferociously beautiful words that, that move us forward and, and, and challenge us to think about who we are and what our values are. And this is a huge and deep subject, and I hope that you'll uh, purchase the books by both of our authors and be in conversation with neighbors, with friends for a reach out across the political divide here and try to make more community and also uh, to, promote, uh, to, promote to promote justice through for our country and, and for other countries as well. So um, thank you very much. And we'll see you once again online or in person at Mechanics Institute. Good night. Thank you.